I'm going to give you uh, an example which uh, 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 shows that um, supplementing uh, a, a physics education by, with some uh, philosophical tools and arguments um, is uh, a necessity for creating what I think is a proper scientist and not a mere technician of a, of a scientific discipline. Let me begin by uh, uh, briefly uh, reminding myself and sharing that with you uh, uh, of a very recent experience of mine. In the, in the late spring of this year, I was having lunch with uh, a, a, a colleague of mine, a theoretical physicist at the University of Cyprus who does superstring theory. And uh, the, the, the subject of our discussion was uh, that uh, um, he was explaining to me the, a number of assumptions that enter in, uh, in string theory. And I was frustrating him with questions that demanded uh, a justification of those assumptions. So we, we were having a discussion, and suddenly we hear a, a loud voice from a table next to us saying, don't listen to him. All they do is idealize. I turn around and I see another colleague from the physics department, a theoretical uh, physicist, a particle physicist, and um, um, I, I impulsively say to him, but doesn't the standard model also employ lots of idealizations? Why do you think only a super string theorist uh, uh, employs them? To make a long story short, it took us a few minutes to realize that um, the difference in our opinion wasn't uh, uh, substantial, it was a language difference. What physicists meant, what phys physicists mean by idealizations is really an identification with uh, 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 assumptions that are not corroborated by experimental data or strongly corroborated. Of course, this is not what uh, philosophers mean by idealizations. And of course, it is very easy to refute um, the idea that physicists have about this notion. Just because it is very easy to refute it, it doesn't mean that philosophers have the right understanding of this notion. However, despite the fact that we don't have the right understanding of the notion, the debates that take place in philosophy of science about idealization would have been very educational to physicists if they were familiarized with them. So the, my talk will be on, on this notion of idealization. And uh, in fact, I am going to argue that everything philosophers have said so far on idealization is wrong. <laughs> uh, um, it's a sketch of an argument, but you will see. But let's, let's start by saying that philosophers believe, all of us believe, that if we had at our disposal the laws that govern the behavior of an arbitrary physical system, if in addition we had a complete and perfectly clear conception of the complexity of the system and we had the knowledge, the cognitive skills, the linguistic tools necessary for describing the complex, that complexity in every bit of its detail, and if we had the computational skills and tools to give an exact analytic solution to the resulting mathematical equation, then philosophers believe that we would be in the position to give a complete explanation of all its behaviors, and it, we, would have, it, we would be able to predict exactly every aspect of all possible behaviors of the system, but of course, philosophers believe that science doesn't work this way. Uh, in each specific scientific domain, <coughs> some general principles are believed to be non-accidental generalizations and are by and large labeled the laws of the, of, of the theory. 
And these are used as antecedents that guide the constructions of models of physical systems. Such models are considered nowadays by many to be primary instruments of scientific representation of their target systems. Of course, physicists may not believe that. They may believe that actually uh, uh, the antecedent <coughs> of, uh, of this conditional is actually taking place in reality. I'm not sure whether they do that or not. Nevertheless, philosophers think that this is, <coughs> this is not what science does. <coughs> <clears throat> in philosophy of science, there are many unresolved issues regarding scientific models. <clears throat> However, we do agree that uh, the cognitive act involved in model building uh, uh, is an act of simplification. Uh, several philosophers uh, have try to explain uh, uh, the, the simplifying assumptions that enter in uh, scientific models. L let me first begin by some examples, just to make sure that we, we, we all speak the same language. We, uh, we, uh, in science, we simplify by ignoring physical parameters, such as when they, uh, scientists ignore the effect of friction. Um, we also simplify by considering the dimensions of a body to be infinitesimally small. Also by considering a variable quantity to have continuous as opposed to discrete values. Uh, also uh, by considering the magnitude of a physical parameter to have a particular frequently extreme value and so on. These are kinds of simplifications that uh, enter in scientific models. The list of such examples is inexhaustible and unnecessary to repro reproduce. Uh, and of course, we all know that such assumptions usually aim to meet particular methodological and epistemic goals, e.g. making mathematical equations tractable or isolating the phenomenon of interest from unwanted noise. Philosophers, the, oh, there is an obvious sense that uh, these assumptions uh, are heterogeneous. And philosophers have tried to put some order in, the, in this heterogeneity uh, by, by claiming and arguing that <clears throat> um, these assumptions can be distinguished into two categories, two groups. What, some uh, philosophers call idealizations and, other, and, 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 uh, and abstractions. Of course, there are exceptions to this rule. Some philosophers have a generic notion of idealization inside which both of these categories uh, uh, coexist. Uh, an example of the first kind is uh, Nancy Cartwright and uh, Martin Jones, Godfrey Smith, and an, an example of the second uh, kind is Hernan McMullen. Nevertheless, despite on which, in which camp you uh, philosophers fall, uh, they all recognize that there, there must be some difference between uh, simplifying assumptions that are considered to be idealizations and simplifying assumptions that are considered to be abstractions. Now, uh, in this paper, this is this is a paper, this is a part of a paper. Um, I, I try um, to address two questions. The first one is, what is the least pro problematic way to distinguish between abstraction and idealization? And the second uh, is uh, um, whether distinguishing the two is enough for explicating the kinds of simplifications that are encountered in, in scientific models. In this talk, I'll only talk about the first uh, question. Uh, I, I will say nothing about the second other than my answer, which is no, <coughs> it is not uh, um, uh, exhaustive. Well, let me, take, uh, let me show you uh, 
the, the, the trend in philosophy of science, or the trend in how to distinguish abstraction from idealization. Nancy Cartwright says in 1989, but she, she, she builds on it in later papers, that <clears throat> she thinks we can distinguish two processes of thought. The, I underline this, two process, distinct processes of thought. The first of which she calls idealization and the second abstraction. Here is how I, I want to distinguish uh, them. In idealization, we start with a concrete object and we mentally rearrange some of its inconvenient features. Abstraction does not involve changing any particular features or properties, but rather subtracting not only the concrete circumstances, but even the material, uh, uh, the material situation. Um, so obviously, in, in Nancy's uh, uh, conception of uh, idealization, uh, uh, in distortion is involved, whereas in abstraction, you simply subtract the features. Uh, Martin Jones uh, um, conceives uh, the, distinctions, uh, uh, the distinction as follows. We should take idealization to require the assertion of a falsehood and take abstraction to involve the omission of a truth. Thus, idealizations yield misrepresentations, whereas abstractions involve omission without misrepresentation. You see how his view is also related to Nazis. There are differences. I'm, I'm abstracting from these differences. <laughs> um, again, uh, Martin uh, 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 um, identifies uh, uh, idealization with distortion, whereas uh, abstraction is just um, uh, omission without misrepresentation. And here is um, uh, Godfrey Smith. In describing something, one may find oneself doing one or both of the following. One, leaving things out while still giving a literally true description. Two, treating things as having features they clearly do not have. The former is a matter of ignoring things, ignoring detail. The latter involves an act of imagination. We imagine that something is different from how it actually is. Well, I, I tend to think that the first one, leaving things out, also involves a lot of imagination, but uh, I, uh, I guess he has something a specific notion of imagination here when uh, he treats uh, the second act. But you, we see that, <coughs> uh, again, um, Godfrey Smith um, treats the distinction roughly as Nancy Cartwright and Martin Jones. Now, um, there are others. There is my friend, Arnon Levy, um, and uh, Bill Bechtel. Um, let me just skip them um, and, uh, and claim that it's the majority. The majority of philosophers of science believe that idealization can be identified with distortion or falsity, falsehood, and abstraction um, with sub subtraction of elements without mis necessarily leading to misrepresentation. Um, now, abstraction in this uh, understanding is understood correctly to be synonymous to omission of features of the target system. Most of these philosophers interpret omission as a thought process that leads to the subtraction or removal of features of the target system. Such an interpretation of abstraction has led to the conclusion that it is a distinct thought process from that of idealization. Since idealization seems to be the cognitive act by which the actual characteristics of a particular feature of the target are changed, and it could be claimed that the cognitive act of removing a feature is qualitatively different from the act of changing its characteristics. This would seem to be a reasonable conclusion to draw, 
which would also enable one to reach some seemingly important qualifications about the characteristics of scientific models. However, there is a flaw in such a view, which relates to how abstraction is construed. If abstraction consists in the cognitive act of subtracting elements of the, act of the target system, it, it would mean that scientists know exactly what has been subtracted from the model description and thus know exactly what's, what must be added back into the model in order to turn it into a more realistic description of its target. But this conflicts with actual modeling in science, where a significant amount of effort is put into discovering what should be added back into the model. In other words, the practice of science testifies that scientists, more often than not, operate without such knowledge. So one is justified in questioning whether the scientists actually know what they are subtracting in the first case. Since it is hard to visualize how a modeler can abstract in the sense of subtracting without knowing what they are subtracting in the first case, one is justified in questioning whether a process of abstraction in, in this sense, the identification with subtraction, is at work in model building. This is one problem from distinguishing uh, uh, idealization and uh, abstraction, as I, as I said. There are five more problems. The first one is that the distinction, as done by Cartwright and the rest of our colleagues, is a distinction that holds only for truth claims. But abstraction and idealization are also present in domains of human creation where truth claims are not meant to be made, both in science and outside of science. In science, for instance, um, when one studies Maxwell's mechanical models, they see that a lot of idealizations and abstractions are found within those models. But Maxwell is not, making any, is not using those models to make any truth claims about electromagnetic phenomena. He is using those models in order to enable, them, uh, enable him to find ways to describe the causal structure of electromagnetism. But if he assumes that in the mechanical model there are idle wheels operating on different vortices, and they don't touch each other, and they never sleep, and so on. These properties of the idle wheels are idealizations within a mechanical model that is not meant to make any truth claims about electromagnetic phenomena. So if I'm going to distinguish idealization from, from abstraction in terms of truth and falsity, then I have to make a truth claim, but the model doesn't make a truth claim, hence uh, 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 I cannot characterize, even the theory of, uh, of idealization by Cartwright and the rest of the colleagues, I cannot characterize the assumptions involved in Maxwell's mechanical models as idealizations or abstractions, but, in, but my intuition tells me that they are. So, in science, uh, idealization and abstraction is present when uh, we don't make truth claims, but also in art. Here is Picasso's <coughs> lithograph of the bull. It consists of 11 uh, lithographs. <coughs> he begins on, on the left corner, uh, in the left upper corner, with the, uh, a bull which is roughly realistic. He adds more uh, realistic features, and then he begins to take it apart. This is his final drawing. This is the bull according to Picasso. Obviously, he has a, 
uh, idealized and abstracted. And he has done that in one complex manner without himself distinguishing within his mind whether one particular act was an idealization and another was an abstraction and so forth. Uh, like all of us, he has just employed abstraction and idealization in, well, like all, all of us, but in much better than most of us. Um, um, and he has employed these two processes, if they are two, um, without making any truth claim. He's not claiming that this bull represents the bull he started with. And he doesn't need to. So his idealizations and abstractions cannot be characterized with their relation to truth or falsity. The second problem of that way of distinguishing the two is a problem of not being able to discern which of the two is carried out. When I assume, I'll give you just one brief example. When I assume, let's say, that the soil around the area of Jerusalem uh, is uniformly fertile, for some scientific purpose I make that, this assumption. When I assume that the soil is uniformly fertile, what am I making, an idealization or an abstraction? Am I abstracting all impurities, uh, or am I idealizing by changing the particular features of the soil around Jerusalem? So it's not easy to use the particular way of distinguishing idealization from abstraction in order to characterize every single assumption that scientists uh, make. The, 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 the third problem is the problem of not being able to determine whether or not an abstraction is actually true or, or potentially true. The more features we subtract, the further from truth we move. Where do we set the dividing line between uh, potentially true and false descriptions. I remind you of uh, uh, Martin Thompson Jones's um, characterization. Uh, uh, an abstraction does not lead to misrepresentation. But if I emit uh, a lot of features, at some point I reach a misrepresentation. The fourth problem is not having an Archimedean point from which to justify the falsity of idealizations. Several idealizations are considered potentially true from the perspective of the theory that prompts them. For instance, Newtonian mechanics assume that the rigid body is a body that carries information at infinite speed uh, uh, from one end to the other. <coughs> Nothing in Newtonian mechanics uh, held that such a body did not exist. That's a, a, me a metaphysical decision. Not, uh, it does not conflict with quantum mechanics, uh, with uh, Newtonian mechanics. At which stage did we have scientific reasons to believe that a Newtonian rigid body doesn't exist? Only after, uh, at the advent of uh, uh, re a special relativity. Only when we, we, we came to believe that the maximum speed by which information traveled was the speed of light in vacuum. So um, unless we had this theory, we would have no way, no Archimedean point by which to judge whether the idealization of a rigid body was false or not. The, 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 the fifth problem is the problem of not knowing if the model distorts or not, whether it leads to a, a falsity. For instance, in quantum mechanics, there are plenty of such cases. Um, um, take, uh, take a simple example and then a slightly more complex example. Um, if I assume that the nucleus um, uh, 
the, the, the potential of it, that the nucleus shows to its uh, electrons is spherically symmetric. I have no way of knowing whether this is false or not, but I do, I, my intuition tells me that it is an idealization. Um, several assumptions that um, uh, um, accompany the, the, the hypothesis for the existence of the Higgs particle and its accompanying Higgs field uh, about symmetry, symmetry breaking and some of the properties of uh, the vacuum. Uh, we don't know whether the Higgs particle exists or not. Maybe soon we'll find out. Um, so we don't know uh, whether uh, the vacuum has those particular properties given by uh, the Higgs mechanism. Suppose we find out that the Higgs particle exists. Does that necessarily mean that we'll find out whether the vacuum has those particular properties or not? Not necessarily. We may never find out what the, the particular properties uh, uh, the vacuum has. Uh, uh, so we will never be able to characterize these assumptions as idealizations about the vacuum or abstractions, whether they are true or false. The fact that we, we cannot know means that we cannot characterize them as true or false, and hence the distinction fails. So if these problems result from focusing in philosophy of science on the character of the final product of simplifying assumptions, and, of course, the related epistemological questions, as well as, as I said earlier, an unsuitable construal of, the, uh, of abstraction. If instead we focus on the reasoning process behind model building and the related, well, then possibly we can overcome these uh, five difficulties. I have a suggestion. My suggestion is that we separate the two. There is one thing, it is the process of idealization. There is another thing, it is the products of idealization. There are a lot of philosophical, philosophically interesting questions about the products of idealization, but they are a separate set of questions. They don't concern the process. The process is one. The human mind works in that way, whether it is creating art or science. And it is, I suggest, the process of selective attention. We select to focus on particular aspects of target systems. And we do that in several ways, or several levels, as I prefer to say. Uh, we could, or a scientist could focus attention only on those features of the target that are considered relevant or useful to the task at hand, <coughs> which means that a, a, a abstraction is construed uh, as a process by which one doesn't subtract the totality of, fi of features, uh, but it extracts that one thing from the totality, that one thing or that set of things on which he or she wants to focus. So abstraction uh, consists in taking out of some context and retaining something while discarding the rest. And you don't know what the rest consists of. And you don't care. This sense of abstraction is, I, th I think, more suitable for, for understanding scientific modeling. 
and sheds a lot of light on, uh, on, on modeling. Uh, but what is idealization? It can also be construed as the result of selective attention. But the obvious difference between abstraction and idealization is, is there to, is to be found somewhere else. I suggest that selective attention operates at two levels. The first is the one of extracting and isolating the features the modeler wishes to focus on. And the second is the level of focusing on particular qualities or quantities of those features, which is idealization. Thank you. I wanted, thanks for your talk, I wanted to ask you whether uh, you think that perception illustrates what you've been saying so far. Perception. perception. Uh, because obviously we select our attention to certain features of our environment because we have to orient, for instance, the glance to features that are important for our, for our action. So we abstract and omit at the same time. We omit to focus on certain features. We omit, but not subtract in that sense. No, yeah. but yeah. it seems to me we're doing the same thing. Oh, yeah. Uh, so this well, reinforces, uh, in a psychological way, what you have been saying about modeling. So modeling is, a, is just a way to reinforce what we know from an empirical level. Uh, uh, in fact, you're, you're revealing uh, my intention. My intention is to naturalize yeah. idealization and abstraction. Uh, but I think what my intuition is exactly the same as yours. However, I think your question should be directed to cognitive scientists rather than me. I can't say anything more than I believe so and so. Thank you. Uh, I want to, um, I, to offer an, uh, an analysis of, of this, the problems and then disagree about the solution. Um, I think that there are actually two problems that, like two meta problems, or no, uh, that you identified. The first is a confusion between epistemology and semantics. Um, they um, sometimes uh, we think that something is true or false relevant or irrelevant, but in fact it is, the world is not as we think it is. And sometimes, as you say, we don't know how the target system actually is, so we imagine it in some way, and then we think that uh, our model is either true or false, and so on. So we are actually, when we talk about truth and falsity, we don't talk about truth and falsity uh, in an absolute sense or in an objective sense, but in an epistemic way. You know, the truth or falsity is what we think to be f true and false. And then some of the problems that you uh, raise uh, um, sort of disappear. But still, the very idea of uh, the, the second problem is a problem of semantics, because uh, which is inherited from all of the discussions about, discussion about models. Um, we don't have a good semantics for models. Uh, models are not true or false. Descriptions of models are true or false. Models stand in other relations to their target system. And, but people, even the, those that started the, the, the tradition, like uh, SAPI, talk about the intentionality of models, about models being true or false, in a very lax, no, in a lax way, as if we all know what we're talking about, as if, uh, Models are in some way still sort of no um, function like linguistic entities, but they don't. So in, in a way, once, once we sort out the, the semantics of models and how they stand in relation to the target system and, and so on, all of those problems that you raise also will disappear. Uh, so I, I suggest that the way to do it is um, to sort out the epistemology and semantics of models and see how they actually correspond 
to their intended target system, not reality, but their intended <laughs> target system. And then we'll have you know, the, the distinction between uh, abstraction and idealization according to this tradition, to the Cartwright uh, Jones tradition, will, will stand. But what you're suggesting is more like what Geary is saying. He's saying, okay, let's, let's talk loosely about uh, models being uh, similar, standing in relations to simili similarity uh, to the worlds, which I don't know exactly what it means, but there's some semantic relation going on there. And then we'll focus about uh, our cognition and cognitive processes, see how actually we work, and then things will work out. But they won't because the, the fundamental problems are still there. I disagree with all three. <laughs> <laughs> First of all, uh, I haven't stated my uh, uh, the similarity relation in Geary is a theory. The similarity relation. I'll take them backwards. The similarity relation in Geary. It's a theory of right, a scientific representation. I, I have said nothing about scientific representation here. I'm talking about the process of idealization. We cannot uh, entangle all of the problems because it, the, it will be a mess. I have a view about scientific representation. It's not, the, uh, it's not one I share with Gary. Um, so uh, scientific representation doesn't enter. It is a related concept. It doesn't enter in this conversation about um, uh, idealization. The, the, the second thing is that uh, models are, con no matter what our semantic uh, um, analysis of models is, which I believe we never agree on one. Um, uh, again, our analysis of scientific models will not uh, answer questions about the nature of the process by which we construct models. It will answer questions related to how the final product, the model, relates to the target system. This is a, a view about the process behind model building. The cognitive process, idealization and abstraction, is the processes by which we construct models. Models are the final products. And I agree with uh, what you said earlier, that models are not necessarily propositions, so they are not necessarily truth claims. However, uh, we can derive propositions from, mod from models, and those propositions are going to be truth claims, and we can evaluate whether uh, a proposition is, a claim is true or, or false. Um, but it will not teach us anything, it will, it will not highlight anything about the process by which I was led to the proposition. If I answer to the question whether a particular claim is true or false, this teaches me something about the target system, not about the process by which I reached the truth claim. This is my difference with uh, my colleagues here. Okay, as many people want to ask questions, please keep to short questions. Okay, I'll try. Um, I'll try to defend the distinction between uh, idealization and uh, abstraction maybe in a, in a bit uh, technical way, uh, let's say I describe a banana as a, a yellow uh, tasty fruit. And now I describe, it, I describe it again just as a yellow fruit, then I might call this as an abstraction because I abstracted away one of the features. And since a banana can be described in uh, many other features, then just by knowing that there can be a, a, a bigger set that encompasses uh, uh, this set of features, maybe that's enough for me to say that this is an abstraction without even knowing what I'm abstracting. So that can be one sense of understanding abstraction, uh, which might be different than idealization that I think is something else, maybe mapping a set of features to a different set and saying they are similar in some sense or in the other sense. So 
But I, uh, I, I agree with you. What you have done is an abstraction. And uh, it is perfectly consistent with my view of selective attention. Because <coughs> that the banana, um, this is ye a yellow fruit. You remain neutral about its other properties. You have just abstracted them. This is a, a, a selective attention in the sense of abstraction, as you said. I have omitted everything else and focused only on the yellowness of this fruit and the fruitness of this object. <coughs> if, however, you said this infinitesimal dot is a yellow fruit, then you have also idealized it because you have selectively attended to something else. You have changed on purpose. You, you have attended to, to the properties in a particular way which suits your purpose. So you have abstracted and idealized. Um, you have employed the two levels of selective attention that I, I, I spoke about. But your intuition is very close to mine. All I'm trying to do is rationalize that intuition. Just a short remark about how these terms are being uh, treated in uh, cognitive science. There are many theories about abstraction. Um, I couldn't now uh, remember any theory of idealization. I would say that in perception and in uh, cognitive semantics, uh, idealization would be understood as one of the motivations maybe for abstraction. So maybe this distinction can be useful for the uh, sense that you're trying to, to take this. But uh, abstraction is, is a very complex process. Uh, subtraction is just one of the sides of it. So I think this could be useful. Uh, and also, yes, there is in cognitive theories since the 70s already a connection between uh, attention studies, perception, and abstraction. So maybe, maybe useful to take a look at it. Cognitive sciences have uh, uh, use only the term abstraction. I agree. With yes. You. Um, they try to differentiate different kinds of abstractions, and some of those <coughs> are what philosophers of science call idealizations. So they're using a different language. But uh, idealization has also a sense of an axiological sense. It's already it makes a judgment. So maybe this is no, where. Not the way No, for cognitivists, I mean. Uh, for, yeah. For, yes, yes, yes. But the, uh, philosophers of science, uh, the term idealization prevailed, uh, prevailed in philosophy of science. But the example that you gave at the beginning, it was axiological. Okay. He said, Maybe. this this is a mere idealization, right, or something like that. So, okay. so it, it may be useful to use the terms of, yeah, right. Yes. Take any but also philosophers, philosophers about 300 years ago, and I'm referring to uh, Locke, Berkeley, and uh, Hume, <coughs> used also on the, the terminology of abstraction. Idealization is something that enters into the, uh, the term idealization. The notion is there in Galileo, in, uh, in Locke, in Berkeley. Uh, um, uh, the term enters into the discussion in philosophy of science I don't know, somewhere in the 70s. And since then, we adapt the terminology. But um, we still have questions about what the notion is. Uh, so uh, it, it's a messy, a, a messy debate in philosophy of science, but we shouldn't be disoriented because of the messy terminology. What you have in mind from cognitive science is a terminology that cognitive scientists use. The notions there are very much related to the notions in philosophy of science. However, philosophy, uh, philosophers of science use different words for those notions. Okay, just one very short question. Uh, I think you would love, and this is the last question. I'm sorry, but we are running out of time. So 
Okay, uh, thanks. Uh, since I agree in general with the thrust of your approach, so just one nitpick about how you describe selective attention. So one class of models that I don't think you mentioned any, any models belonging to this class is targetless models, where we uh, have targetless models, say a model of organisms with three sexes rather than two. Okay, so people build such models and then they go about hunting for uh, a target. So how would you describe the selective attention process going on, if at all, uh, in constructing such models? Because you talked about selective attention to the target. Mm -hmm. The target system, uh, first of all, uh, this is a, uh, I'm sure you are aware, this is a very difficult question. I, uh, I cannot do any justice to, to it, right? Uh, 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 the target system is not necessarily a real world system. Uh, my answer to you is what is not mine. It belongs to Hernan Macmundi. It, it's an idealization involved at the level of the problem situation, not at the level of the model itself. So you change the problem situation. So, uh, idealization doesn't only enter in the in the model itself; it also enters in the in the, in the problem situation. But even this answer is not enough to to, to solve the problem. Thank you. Okay, let's thank you again.